uh, really appreciate uh, you joining us today. One of the reasons that I have joined the, as, as an organizer here is because I like to see the community thrive. I like to see you know, that I don't have to go to New York or California to, <laughs> to actually enjoy an event like this. So hopefully all of you, uh, first timers and not first timers, have learned something uh, and we still have a couple of sessions. So one of the um, one of the things that uh, that we have done before actually started at, at one of these events was organize a community event on data for good. Um, and I first met Jordan Meyer at the uh, the first data for good event that we had at Max Point back then, and he uh, created a shiny uh, app that uh, was really very impressive for everybody. He came all the way from California just that weekend to work with us uh, for that for that event. Um, after that, he had moved to, to North Carolina uh, to be with family and also volunteer for as a data ambassador for the Data Kind event that we had uh, at SAS. In a couple of weeks ago, I saw that they were finalists in the um, in the Kaggle competition, and I said. Can you please come over <laughs> and join us at the Analytics Forward? So I'm really glad that he's here and that he will be sharing uh, his experience. So thank you, Jordan. Thanks, Eddie. Hey, thanks, everybody. So yeah, today I'm talking about Kaggle in the real world. Um, kind of implies Kaggle's not real world. We'll get to that. But uh, the. Um, I'm really excited because this is the first chance I've had to actually share the uh, lessons learned from the, the Zillow Prize win. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the techniques and uh, processes that we used. Um, so for those who don't know, Kaggle is an online platform that hosts machine learning competitions. <clears throat> and these competitions, pretty much anyone in the world can go and download data. Uh, companies will put their data onto Kaggle and uh, you can build predictive models off these data sets upload them back to Kaggle and then see where you fall on the leaderboard, uh, your prediction accuracy versus pretty much anyone else who's, who's competing. So usually the top three teams on Kaggle win a prize, and then the top percentiles will get a medal. And the medal goes towards like badges and stuff, and you can be a master or a grandmaster on Kaggle. Um, there's actually a wide range of contests. I think the top one there uh, is interesting. It's the Two Sigma Challenge. So this one's I think is still going on. It may have just finished, but uh, you're trying to predict stock prices from news data. So text analytics, trying to figure out, does this move the market or not? Uh, on the other side of the spectrum at the bottom, you've got a pet finder prediction, where you're trying to look at images of pets and the descriptions that people wrote about the pets and predict how long that animal would be in a shelter. Uh, so really wide range of uh, interesting competitions. So you know this talk's called Kaggle in the Real World, and uh, I think if you look around on, on the internet, you'll find that a lot of people don't think that Kaggle is representative of real world data science, right? Most of the people in this room, I think, are professionals. A lot of what you see on Kaggle is not the kind of thing that you would do in your day-to-day -day work. Um, I think Kaggle machine learning competitions have a reputation for resulting in overly complex solutions that are like difficult to recreate or put into production. So. The Netflix Prize, which was another $1 million competition, <clears throat> was run by a team who, the solution was never actually used by Netflix. It was so complicated that they just didn't even put it into production. Had a lot of cool ideas in it, I'm sure, that they used, but they couldn't use the actual solution. Um, this is just a quick Google search on Kaggle data science, and you can see a lot of the things that pop up, so a lot of skepticism. Um, I think some of the most common concerns, i got a list here, the, the problems are always already well formulated and the metrics are predefined. So you know exactly what target you're predicting, you know exactly how you're going to be measured. That's, you know, there's, in, the, in an industry setting there's going to be ambiguity, right? So uh, figuring out all of that, knowing how to piece together the steps towards getting a solution is something that we all do in our daily work and it doesn't happen that often in Kaggle. But there, you know, this, this concern I think is, is pretty valid. Um, data is often anonymized, so you, you know there's no real need to understand the data or have uh, uh, domain expertise. This one I, I agree with half and half. I mean, sometimes there's definitely understanding that you can have in a competition that's going to help you win. Um, 
an interesting thing that came out of the early capital competitions was that a lot of the domain expertise, uh, people with domain expertise didn't win. Uh, it would be physicists and people who just approached it like from a pure mathematical standpoint who actually would end up winning. So sometimes I think uh, domain expertise, you know, can be a hindrance if you're if you're not you know thinking outside the box, which you often have to do to win a, a capital competition. Um, the data in most cases is going to be relatively clean, so we all of course have to deal with dirty data. Uh, most of capital competitions do have very clean data. Um, and then competitions are won by small margins that aren't worth the effort. This one I definitely agree with. Like, I mean, it's a significant amount of extra work to get a third decimal place improvement on a Kaggle leaderboard that most companies, I mean, imagine trying to tell a client, uh, I want 10 times the money so I can get you, uh, you know, 1% less error. You know, they're not gonna, not gonna buy it, right? Um, so Kaggle CEO actually chimed in on one of those core questions that was on there, and uh, you know I think this is pretty spot on. He says they cover a decent amount of what data scientists do, but the two big missing pieces are specifying a business problem as a data science problem, which includes the cleaning and parsing of that data, and then putting those models into production. So the Zillow Prize <coughs> in round two had a couple of special rules that I think addressed both of these missing pieces. So in the first one, they allowed competitors to use any relevant data that we could find on the internet. So uh, we did have to uh, structure and find interesting data that would help us predict the, um, uh, the price of a house. And uh, for the second one, the submissions were required to be reproducible as a Docker container with a single script, with a run all script. script. You just hit that and it would have to pull all the data from the internet, parse it, train your models and do the model predictions all in one go. And I had to do that on commodity hardware in a short amount of time. So Kaggle uh, and uh, Zillow were, were thinking about this for, for, for this challenge. And I think, you know, uh, I'm gonna try to highlight some of the, the things that we did in that context, because I really want this to be useful outside of just like climbing the leaderboard here. Um, yeah, so if you aren't familiar, you know, Zillow's an online real estate website. They have something called the Zestimate that prices every home in the country. You can just go and look at your house or your neighbor's house and see how much Zillow thinks it's worth. When they first introduced it, the median error rate was something like 14%. And over the years, I think it's down now to 4.5%. Uh, in 2017, they reached out to the data science community on Kaggle uh, about a million dollar prize to whichever team could beat both this estimate and all the other competitors. And if you didn't beat this estimate, then the prize would be $100,000. So, you know, uh, you definitely had to do both. It was a two round competition. Um, these are some summary stats here about the, the two rounds. Um, the one on the left is the qualifying round. So the top 100 people from the first round, that was in 2017, uh, moved on to the second round. You can see at the top that uh, only 40 teams finished the final round because there was so much to do with all of that containerization mm -hmm. and cleaning of all that data that a lot of people essentially dropped out of those top 100 um, teams. Also, uh, people uh, agglomerated, I guess, like I, I joined another team uh, in round two as well. So uh, the equations underneath are how we were evaluated. I think round one there was the difference between this estimate and the sale price, which is a little bit tricky you weren't actually predicting the price in round one. You were predicting how wrong the estimate is. And that's like very unintuitive. So I think this fell into the trap that I talked about earlier where you know understanding doesn't quite help. Because it's like, of course, square footage is gonna matter to the sale price. But square footage didn't really matter much in round one because the estimate had already extracted all the signal from square footage. So it was a little bit weird. And my goal really was just to make it through round one so I could get to round two because my background really is in consulting and things like uh, external, allowing external data, um, runtime limitations, and exact reproducibility are things that I've had to work with, and I thought maybe you know would give me at least uh, put me on par with all the more experienced Kagglers. Uh, a quick note about the uh, the data. So the, they gave us property data um, in both rounds. It was pretty similar. Just imagine, I guess, a giant spreadsheet with one row per house and then one column per feature of the house. Uh, so things like the square footage, number of bedrooms, fireplace, and then uh, there's like one spreadsheet that looked like that per year. So panel data, 
over the 10 years in the second round. And the sales data was also just kind of a giant spreadsheet that had the date of the sale, the property ID, and then the target in the first round, the difference from the estimate in the second round, the actual price. So you had to join that back in. So that's kind of what we were working with. And the goal is really to predict that target from that uh, sale data. So uh, here you can see I, I joined Kaggle eight years ago, but round one of the Zillow Prize was actually the first Kaggle competition I competed in. Um, so I've done a lot of data wrangling and productionalizing. I thought, you know, maybe I had a chance at the second round. Um, my first round team actually came in fourth place, but the teammate uh, that I had wasn't able to compete in round two, so I started round two as a sol solo competitor. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the second round, really, because that's the one that had all the real world constraints. So unlike me, my second round teammates were Kaggle veterans. Um, they're both Kaggle Grandmasters, so they have five or more gold medals, and together they've competed several times and gotten in the top three and, and won money before. Um, Chahu is a computer science professor in Morocco. He's really incredibly good at building neural networks, um, and he's currently 19th uh, in the world on Kaggle. Um, Nima is a startup CEO in Toronto. Uh, his previous startup built forecasting models for grocery stores at the item level, uh, so he brought like a tremendous amount of very interesting forecasting knowledge um, and time series knowledge to the competition. And he's also been uh, 19th in the world. And so uh, in round two, they were working together and they called themselves Chan Estimate, just a combination of their first names. So when I joined, we just added a J and tried to convince everyone to call it Change Estimate, but you know, uh, a bit of a stretch. <laughs> so so, yeah, so uh, I think Nima had the really great quote about uh, how we actually won this competition. Uh, he says, for every idea that worked, there were 100 that didn't work, but we kept going. So I think that sums it up. I mean, there wasn't a single moment, like, aha, we're going to win. We got this cool neural network architecture or something. Or any one trick, it, it was uh, the sum of a bunch of incremental improvements, lots and lots of small improvements as we went along. And most of the bigger improvements came early on. So the the we worked our way up the leaderboard and then just kind of very, very small steps once we, once we got there. Um, so this talk's gonna be about the process that we used, and I wanna highlight some of the uh, techniques for those early large improvements, because I think those you can use right away very quickly in real world projects, and uh, they were the ones that, that gave us the, the most lift. So I'm gonna call our process structured experimentation. Uh, the first step is to optimize your experimental lab. That's just preparation. Um, the second step is really the core of the experimentation, and that's treating every experiment as a hyperparameter. If you're not familiar with what, what that means, I'll, I'll uh, show some uh, graphs. And uh, uh, you know, blend your most diverse results. So putting together all of these experiments in a way that gives you the strongest ensemble of, of techniques and models. So I think this applies well to capital competitions and to professional projects. The main difference is like how long you're willing to spend on step two. So uh, every decimal place matters in Kaggle, so we pretty much uh, ran step two all the way till the last day of the competition. Um, but on the, on the flip side, I, I work at a company called Data Robot that automates this process, and I've seen this set of steps uh, take a relatively clean data set to production in a day. So it's definitely not something you know that I talk about today that you have to spend you know months and months on. Okay, so step one is optimizing your experimental lab. The goal of this one is to reduce the barrier of entry for each new experiment. You don't want to start from scratch every idea you have. Uh, you want to be able to to hit the ground running. So. What do I mean by experimental lab? So this is a traditional uh, production pipeline for IT architecture. Uh, you know, on the left-hand side, data is coming in from uh, customers and the customer-facing applications. Transactions end up in a data lake or a large database, and then you know you report from some data warehouse over on the far right-hand side. This is, I think, really important to organizations, and it's something that you want to live with IT. You want rigorous change management because any kind of mistake in there is going to interrupt. You know actual operations, right? Um, this slide is actually from a document that my previous consultancy, Ritma Mead, wrote with uh, Oracle about something that at the time we were calling the Discovery Lab. 
So the idea of the Discovery Lab is that organizations need to create infrastructure that's outside of that execution layer, that production pipeline, um, for rapid experimentation. And it doesn't matter if it's a laptop with R or like a desktop with a GPU or even like an on-demand AWS server. The, the hardware and software doesn't really matter. It's, what's important is that it's convenient to pull data quickly and easily out of any step in the execution pipeline. Um, so, uh, you know, then you can just grab data, experiment on it, and then whether the result of that experiment is an insight that you want to put on a dashboard or a predictive model that you want to put into production, the other side that's really important is that you can get that output easily back into the pipeline. Um, but, you know, whether you use Python or R or a laptop or a cloud server, when I'm talking about optimizing this lab, I'm not talking about you know, the, the specific hardware I'm, I'm talking about, um, setting it up for rapid experimentation. And my best advice for that actually comes from a chef, Sean Brock. So Sean Brock's most important rule for home cooking is he who dies with the biggest pantry wins. Uh, he says, even with no food in the house, I can put together a crazy meal. That's the whole reason why you keep your pantry stocked. So I think a well-stocked data science pantry is the key to optimizing an experimental lab. Our goal is, again, to minimize the friction for new experimentation, right? So if we have to start every experiment from scratch, it's like getting one of those fancy cookbooks where there's sub-recipes for every recipe and you spend the whole day trying to make one meal. Um, so in this analogy, our code is like a recipe. It's good to have a repository of code, but maybe not good enough. Um, what we really want are reproducible environments that have your data that you can open two years later and still expect them to work. So these are the data science pantry items. So I use Docker uh, as my canning jars, but our projects or Python environments or whatever sort of encapsulation tool that you want to use, as long as it's something that allows you to open up your data uh, two years later and not have to worry about, uh, is this version compatibility going to be an issue? Uh, do I need to update this software? Uh, that's going to work for you probably. So I'm going to walk through two examples from my data science pantry that helped me during the Zillow Prize. The first one is the NC Data for Good uh, thing that uh, Zadie mentioned. Um, it came for, from a data crunch that was like an all-day event uh, that I did about a year before the Zillow Prize started. So at that event, we were given a number of data sources like school and food pantry locations. And we were asked to like shed light on food insecurity in the triangle. So most of the data scientists there were using tools like R and Python to run spatial analytics on the data sets. Um, my team looked at things like distance from a grocery store or distance from a food pantry to figure out where are the food deserts. So we built maps using Leaflet, which is a JavaScript library you can call from R. Uh, we used charts in ggplot, which is a popular R package. And then we delivered all those charts and uh, maps through a dashboard that we made was shiny. And uh, after that event ended, I took some extra time to clean up the code and make sure that it would run in a Docker container, figuring it might come in handy for like a future a data dive or a hackathon. Um, so when I wanted to examine the mistakes that my models were making during the Zillow Prize, I started up that container, uh, everything still worked, and I was halfway to the dashboard that you see here. Um, so in this dashboard, I'm looking at houses that sold for much more or much less than my models were predicting and trying to find patterns that would help suggest other data sources that I could bring in and help the models make better predictions. Um, in the top right, you can see the uh, distributions of year built for good and bad predictions. Uh, the top is the uh, good predictions, the bottom there is the bad predictions. So you know, older houses are harder to predict. They can typically go either way. Uh, maybe they've got a beautiful renovation or they're falling apart, right? Newer houses, much easier to predict. So you can see the distribution is quite skewed there. Um, so the renovation data that, that Zillow gave us was pretty spotty. So this led me to experiment with trying to aggregate known renovations in certain neighborhood blocks um, and even to like try to collect building permit data from uh, online sources like uh, New York City's open data. So the next pantry item that really helped my solution was also from a volunteer event. It was the Data Kind and Habitat for Humanity 
event that happened about one month before the Zillow price started. Um, so our team was focused on identifying the regions most in need of housing assistance, which is pretty fortuitous for this competition. Um, again, we started with data from Habitat for Humanity. And then in addition to that data, I set up a bunch of R scripts that would pull data from the American Community Survey and the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Um, and then work to join all that stuff together by census tract and census block, block group. Um, and then after the data dive, I spent you know half a day trying to make sure that all that work could be used again, that, that any time I needed it, I could pull that data very quickly because census and mortgage data is useful for just about anything where you have a customer's location. Uh, that's a lot of information that you can add to a predictive model. And so about a month after that data dive, uh, Zillow announced the Zillow prize. And having all that data ready, already joined and flattened to the track and the block group level, it made it easy to add it to my models and have them make better predictions. So here's a map from that same Residual Explorer app. And it's colored by the owner occupied percent. So how many of these houses are uh, rented, essentially? The inverse of that is the rental. Um, so a column is from the ACS data. And uh, rental markets and owner markets are actually pretty different in terms of what people are willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. So it was really important when I gave my models this, they were able to make much better predictions because they were able to identify uh, this is a rental area, so maybe condos are going to be worth a little bit more than they would be in a non-rental area. So at the time I did these events, you know, I didn't know they'd end up being used for the Zillow Prize, uh, but I did think they'd be really good in a data science pantry. Um, you know, so I put the time in to make them easy to reproduce, right? I think if you all are interested in this idea of trying to optimize your own experimental lab, I definitely would recommend volunteering at events like this um, because you get to work with lots of other data scientists and pick up on the techniques that they use, and then you can incorporate that and actually try to make it reproducible. Um, I'd also recommend Kaggle competitions, of course. I did two competitions in between round one and round two of the Zillow Prize, and both of the uh, competitions had models that I ended up re repurposing in, uh, in the second round of the Zillow Prize. So I think as an organization, it's like really hard when you're trying to meet a deadline to try to put in the extra effort and, and make sure all of the stuff that you've done is reproducible in the future. But like usually there is at least you know a day or two after a project, hopefully for most of you, um, where there's some downtime, and I, I would highly recommend taking that time to do this kind of encapsulation because it really uh, is worth it in the long run. So that's step one. Step two is to treat every experiment as a hyperparameter, and uh, what I mean by that really is building model pipelines. So this is an image of a model pipeline from Data Robot. We call these blueprints. The idea is that it's important to tune not just the model itself, but all the pre-processing steps that happen prior to running your model. Each of the gray boxes in this has the parameters that can be set, and their settings can impact the overall quality of the model. So this is a relatively simple one, but these can get really large. So for the Zillow price, I think the three of us spent about 400 hours each tuning our pipelines. And uh, you know, as we worked on these models, the improvements from the changes that we made to each one of these boxes got smaller and smaller for the most part. Uh, at the end of the second round, the difference between first and second place was measured at the third decimal place. And the distance between the second and third place was measured at the fifth decimal place. So I'm really glad that we put in all that time to uh, you know, that we, that we did for this, but in most real world applications, I think that small of an improvement isn't gonna be worth that uh, extended effort, right? So in this section, I'd like to highlight three of the specific techniques that we used early on that gave us the biggest lift uh, that I think apply to a lot of different scenarios. So the first technique was creating a threshold for removing outliers. Uh, so the, all three of us actually found this independently before we teamed up. Um, and uh, it was one of the biggest improvements from any single trick that we use. So I personally don't like to throw away data, um, but not all home sales are normal, right? So like a parent might sell a house to a child for way less than it's worth. A uh, Russian oligarch might sell or buy a condo for five times what it's worth. Um, 
and, and those sales can confuse an otherwise good model, right? So you don't want to update your model when it makes a good prediction that was otherwise unpredictable. Um, so to remove these outlier sales, we first had to split the data. So as a team, we agreed to hold the final three months of the data out of our training, right? So we had 10 years of data. We just took the last three years of say, three months of sales and said, no one used this in training. We're all going to validate our scores on this. Um, the goal was to simulate having to predict the future by training our models, uh, you know, all the way up to a specific point and then testing on the final three months. So if then when we trained on the full data, it would be like when we're predicting the three months in the actual leaderboard. So that's the red data in this chart, the holdout. Um, so within the data that we could use though, that's the blue data, we ran a cross-validation routine. So there's five folds in that cross-validation, five blocks of blue data. So we would train on four of those blocks and then predict the fifth block. And the uh, then record in that fifth block how wrong we were about the houses in that block. And we moved that around over all the boxes, so we, we ended up predicting all of the boxes by all the other four, right? And then we have now uh, you know, a list of every house and how hard it was to predict, essentially. So we just experimented at that point with the different error thresholds, like how many of these houses should we remove? Um, which of these are gonna, gonna actually hurt the model? So we trained then with all of the blue training data, trying different thresholds, like let's only let in a few outliers to let's in a lot of them, um, and, uh, and then validated on that holdout, which still had the outliers in it, uh, and we tried to get that error on the holdout down to the minimum error. Uh, that was a big uh, improvement that all three of us ended up um, using. We did a very similar thing with feature engineering, right? So that's removing outliers. Here we calculated hundreds of additional features uh, at the beginning prior to actually running any models. And a lot of these features turn out to just be noisy or redundant. So, you know, something like uh, price and square feet would be in the data set. So we would also make one price per square feet, let's say. That one turned out not to be redundant, but um, certainly a lot of these ratios were not that useful. So just like the uh, outlier threshold, we tested feature importance and removed the features whose impact weren't as large as the threshold. So I use something called permutation importance to do this. Uh, with permutation importance, we also have to split the data. In this case, I trained on the full blue set of data and was validating again on the last three months. Um, and after having trained a model on the blue data, essentially you take the, you make a prediction for the holdout set and you get a score, you get your, your leaderboard score. And then each column, you go in and you just shuffle that column, essentially turning it into noise and ask the model to predict it again. And so if the model's just as good, it's not really paying attention to that column because you essentially disrupted its ability to learn or make predictions from that column. If it's much worse, then that's a very important column. And you just rank order by how bad the model gets when you shuffle this column, right? So once that's done, you have uh, a, a potential for another threshold. So what we did was, you know, if try from the uh, letting every column in, and then saying, let's remove the least important columns and work our way up, and try to find the point at which we hit the best score on that, um, that threshold. Uh, I mean, on the whole outset set. So there's one more technique that I'd like to lump in with these that had the biggest impact, um, and that's how we handle categorical features. So at the end of the first round, someone asked in the forums how, how other competitors approach these, and they gave a few examples and asked what other people thought, right? So a categorical in the Zilla data set would be something like, uh, with, that has nominal values. So it would be like architectural styles, like it could be a contemporary house or a colonial or ranch, or something with a lot of nominal values like city or even census tract. Um, so a lot of modeling algorithms can only work with numeric variables. And uh, these nominal columns need some sort of numeric representation for, to, to be useful in those, uh, those models. So the encoding methods that, that Horizon, the person asking the question listed here, were label encoding. That's where you might just sort them alphabetically and give them a number, an integer number, and let the model sort it out. So it doesn't have a lot of information in there, but it gives the ability to, to split on these different categoricals. They also mentioned 
one hot encoding, probably everyone's familiar with that, it's dummy variables and linear regression. So it's really common, but in architectural style, it's fine. There's maybe eight styles. You have eight new columns with a bunch of zeros in it, right? But when we're talking about city or census block group, there's tens of thousands of additional columns that you have to have. So this kind of breaks down for larger categoricals. And uh, they also mentioned mean encoding. This is the one that I think worked really well. Uh, you know, it's you could use the previous sale price of houses in, in the city, and, and uh, or previous sale price of houses of that architectural style, and just replace the name of the city with the number that is the price per square foot, let's say, in that city. Um, so Horizon here was worried about overfit. Um, that is something that can happen when you do this like mean encoding. You're putting the target back into your feature set, which is generally a bad idea. Mm -hmm. But because this was a time series competition, you could always just make sure that it was backwards looking and you know, get around at least uh, the, the biggest worries of overfit. So I really like Miguel's response down there at the bottom where he says, this is easily the question of the $1 million, especially when you consider how that encoding interacts with the chosen models. So that's like that blueprint approach, right? Like you, you don't, it may be that one model does really well with mean encoding and another does really well with ordinal encoding. Um, so my answer to this question would have been, I didn't answer it, but it would have been, uh, you know, try them all and make sure that you try it in a repeatable way where you make a function so that you can uh, put it in your blueprint and see how it impacts with all the other changes that you might make uh, in this long process that's getting you to your prediction. So this is just an R pseudocode function showing what I'm talking about here. It takes a data frame, then a list of the categorical values, and a simple integer for which encoding to use. So now in your long model pipeline code, you can just loop over the different methods and figure out which one is going to work best with all the other decisions you've made uh, downstream. So when you allow each step in your pipeline to have its own parameters, you end up with gigantic feature spaces, right? Uh, very search spaces, very large search spaces. Um, I like a package called Hyperopt to work with this. It's in Python. Um, it helps narrow down on the best combination of parameters without just searching over every single one, which would take forever. I mean, that said, like, my computer was running 24-7 for probably six months um, running uh, different variations of these pipelines, trying to find all the best combinations. So I think that this cost is worth it, like this large search space is worth it, because there's an amazing byproduct, which is that you could have one pipeline that results in two radically different predictions. Um, and that, that I think, you know, if you're familiar with model ensembling, you probably know why that's important, but I'll talk about that now in, uh, in step three. So I, here I say blend your most diverse results. So if, if you've given every decision in your pipeline a hyperparameter, you can maximize not only the accuracy, but also the diversity from the other models in your ensemble. Um, if you have four models that all agree, you basically have one model. Um, so if each model is gonna make an independent contribution to the ensemble, then the, the sum of the parts is significantly stronger. Um, a common uh, term for these, um, this type of ensembling is mixture of experts. I think we should probably take it further and call it mixture of specialists to really highlight the importance of the diversity of the individual pieces. So the common technique that's used on Kaggle is called stacking. If you're not familiar, I'd recommend this blog post. It's called Stacking Made Easy. Um, definitely the best uh, treatment I've seen uh, in blog form. And uh, in the image on the right there, there's three base learners, three models, predictive models. There's a linear regression, the blonde guy, a support vector machine, and then a k-nearest neighbors algorithm. So each one is going to predict the target. It's going to predict, in our case, the home sales. The next layer of learners has a deep learning algorithm on the left and a random forest on the right. And they're learning based on how wrong the base learners were in the past. So they don't see the original data. They're learning just like historically which one of these three models is right and when should I believe them. They also learn interactions, right? So maybe when SVM here is disagreeing with uh, logistic or linear regression and k nearest neighbors, then they've learned to trust it a bit more. You see, their prediction is much higher. So uh, 
if the support vector machine is breaking out, then they, they pay more attention to it. So they learn all these like meta um, relationships here. And then the top level learner is doing the same thing with the two lower lear learners um, predictions as well. And it seems like he's trusting the random forest a bit more in this case. Um, and that's a gradient boosting machine. This is really, really common in Kaggle. It, you'll see stacks five or 10 levels sometimes, uh, huge, huge stacks of, of models like this. I think this approach leverages the strengths of each algorithm and it helps to have some of the models kind of fill in and correct for the other model's mistakes. But of course, if all of your first layer models here agree, there's nothing for the second and third layer to do, right? So Kagglers have a lot of strategies for trying to ensure that their base level models, their first layer uh, models are very different. And one common strategy is that they just don't share anything with their teammates. Even after teaming up, it's just like, no, here's my predictions. I'm not gonna tell you what I'm doing to get them. Uh, that way people end up having divergent solutions just because they you know, simply didn't share and they, they all took different approaches. It's, it's tempting you know, when someone tells you, look, I found this amazing trick to just try to incorporate it in and suddenly your score goes up too. But of course, when you try to blend, if you're, if you're now too correlated, it's not gonna be good. So ensembling and stacking in this way is one of the reasons why it's pretty close to impossible to win a Kaggle competition by yourself. Um, and almost every top Kaggler is like joining teams. So even if you try to make several divergent models on your own, uh, there's only one, there's only so many paths that one person can think of. So trying to team up on Kaggle can be pretty awkward, right? So you wanna be careful about how much information you share about your approach. For starters, it's against the rules to tell uh, anyone outside of your team what you're doing. And then you don't wanna to share too much with a competitor who you eventually don't team up with because then they know all your tricks, right? Um, so in round two, I was talking with Nima and Shafu mostly about how much time we had left and were willing to put in the, in the remainder of the competition, which was a lot. Um, and uh, you know, we were hoping, of course, that our solutions would end up being complementary, but we didn't know for sure until we joined. And then when we did, I said, hey, I've got a neural network and a gradient boosted trees model that I'm combining. And they said, oh, great, we have a neural network and a gradient boosted trees model that we're combining. So these were our initial correlation scores across our models. A lot of 99. So in fairness though, they look less diverse than they actually were because these were correlations of the log sale price. So there's a lot less variance, right? So this, it, it was you know, better than it looks here, but like most things with Kaggle, all the action's in the third decimal place there. Um, so our initial, our initial ensemble did improve when we combined these models, but it was pretty clear that you know, there was more work for us to do uh, we had two and two of the same uh, types of approaches. Um, so what we decided was that Chahu and I would take our neural networks and try to push them away as far as we could from the two gradient boosted trees models. We spend most of our time now on making our neural networks very different. So at the end of the competition, these were the correlations. Uh, we were both able to reduce the, you know, the correlations that the neural networks had with the other models. You can see those are in the first and last column. I was actually fairly concerned of, that there might be a bug in the neural network one, which was mine. Um, there was a previous model that we tried that had a bug in it, and it got a 0.98 correlation. So that's the scale we're working with. 0.98 was just like, you know, still seems like it's a lot of correlation, but it was terrible on the leaderboard. So when I had this 0.99, I was worried I spent like a full day checking my code to see maybe, you know, is there anything wrong with it? And then there was four months in between when we submitted and when they told us who won. So this was actually the, the you know, nightmare scenario for me was that this was gonna be the model that ruined it for everyone. Um, <laughs> but in the end it was okay. This, that model, the least correlated one, was seventh in the final leaderboard by itself. And what happened was our model was weighting it for rural areas. It was really looking to uh, rural areas in our ensemble. So here's why I think that the neural network was better uh, in those areas, and uh, this is actually my go-to source of diversity when I'm trying to make very different models. So I try to take advantage of one of the fundamental theorems in um, machine learning, which is this bias-variance trade-off. This image is from one of the early lectures in the Coursera 
um, uh, Andrew Ng's videos for machine learning. So on the left is a high bias model. It's simpler. It's not fooled by noise, but it misses subtle variation in the data, right? And on the right-hand side is a high variance model, which is more complex, but it's got, you know, you know, if you pick up minor fluctuations that might help, but it can also easily overfit to noise. So one of the key tasks when you're trying to fit a predictive model is finding the right balance between bias and variance. So what I like to do is push a little bit in each direction with two separate models and then combine them. Uh, I think that our high variance models perform well in, in uh, urban areas where, you know, like a neighborhood can change in a city block. You know, you just go few few feet down the road and the houses seem quite different. But then the high bias model was better in rural areas like suburbs and, you know, fully rural areas. So like, imagine trying to use the same predictive model to predict New York City downtown and then Eastern North Carolina, right? Very, very different levels of uh, bias and variance you might want to shoot for. So two of the techniques from the last section actually were very instrumental in how I was able to push those two models apart on that bias variance spectrum, right? The outlier threshold. So if we want a high bias model, we set the outlier threshold very low. So we're only letting in the representative sales, the most normal sales, like the average sales. Uh, and then our model's gonna be a lot more likely to predict an average sale price. Uh, not, not, it's gonna be very conservative, essentially, in its predictions. But if we want more variance, then we just increase that threshold. So for my XG boost model, I had significantly wider bounds. And because there are some times that those outlier uh, houses were justified in that price, and so it learned those and was better, especially in cities where, again, there can be quite a bit of variation. Um, same thing with the feature threshold, right? So for the high bias neural network, I just said you you can only use the most important features. So removed the noisiest features from the bottom, and that gave it more bias, less to work with, essentially less noise. But then for the XG boost, where I was trying to up the variance, I gave it a whole lot more of those rarer columns, things like does it have a sauna um, that occasionally does help you make a better prediction um, and uh, uh, could also have noise in it, right? So that was, that was the, the way to spread those out. So in the end, our, our ensemble looks something like this. So Data Robot also does model blending, and I recreated our ensemble on a small data set uh, from Kaggle, it's the Ames, Iowa data set, just to get this image here. Um, so while some Kaggle competitions you know, are one of those huge stacks, we decided to just blend our four models with a single blender. Um, we felt like given the strength of the individual models and then the constraints on processing time, that this was gonna be the best bet. So not a huge stack, but definitely one model that's goal was to combine the other ones uh, in the best way, and that model was able to figure out, okay, this one's really good in uh, Iowa, and this one's really good in uh, New York City. Um, so I've been talking about bias and variance. I think that's a major source of diversity that you can work with. Um, but there's plenty of others. Uh, there's some other uh, examples here, like we use different categorical encodings across all our models. So some use that mean encoding, some use ordinal encoding. We use um, the uh, categorical embeddings in neural networks. So lots of different ways that you can treat these categoricals. And by changing those, the models found different things and they were able to contribute independent uh, insight. We optimize different objective functions. So here in this ensemble, you can see that like the light GBM is using a gamma loss, and the XG boost is using a Poisson loss. We did something very similar for, but our, ours were log transformed. Uh, all those ratios that I talked about, like price per square feet, I just did all of my, in my XG boost model, all of that mean encoding, the previous sale price in my neighborhood or whatever, was by price per square feet. But Nima, who made the light GBM model, used the exact price. So that small difference, you know, made uh, pushed our models apart and, and made them uh, make slightly different predictions. So by maximizing the diversity of these individual models, uh, occasionally actually did hurt performance. So that neural network that I pushed really far away did do a little bit worse than it was doing before I tried to push it far away. But when we blended them, having done that, the blend got significantly better. So definitely worth it. So that's it. Um, you know, there's 
these are the three steps, I think, that can help both with capital competitions and with professional projects. So in summary, it's important that you don't start from scratch for every new idea you have. You, you want that data science pantry available to you. It's important to capture every decision that you make as a parameter in your pipeline. And then finally, it's important to optimize those parameters both for accuracy and for diversity, focusing on the performance of the ensemble and not the individual models. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, to what extent was Dr. kind of a, a lifesaver or a time saver? Was it a big, small, medium difference for someone who's looking to to start getting into Docker and uh, just container storage in general? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's a time sink. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the question is, uh, is uh, to what extent is Docker a time saver? Um, and uh, I would say it's a time sink at first by a lot. You know, you're going to spend you know a week or two learning all the different uh, features of it and all that kind of stuff. Um, having gotten to that point now, though, it was really, really important for the uh, those like uh, um, data science pantry items I showed, but also at the end they asked us to Dockerize the solution for them, and I think you saw, you know, hundred teams came into to the round two, and only forty finished. I think a lot of them fell out after doing all of that work when they realized they had to make it all perfectly reproducible in a Docker container in fifteen days, which is what they gave us uh, after the end of the competition. And they gave us the specs that we had to do the Docker container by. Uh, I had a lot of experience with Docker. It still took me quite a bit of time. I think a lot of people just, you know, just couldn't do it. So it would have saved time for them. Uh, let's go back here. There's one behind you, Zadie. Oh. So you don't happen to have um, any of your Docker pantry items open source to you? I don't <laughs> yet. That's a great question. Uh, I should do more of that. Uh, but th both of those should be, and I, uh, yeah, uh, I'll take that as a suggestion. I should do it. For sure. Question. Do you know whether the, in the Netflix prize whether the second and third solutions were actually more readily deployable or whether Netflix used them? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I have heard that um, they used pieces of it, of, of the top one, so I would bet if they got all the code, they also did the same. Certainly Kaggle's doing that. I'm sorry, uh, Zillow's doing that with all our solutions. With uh, the competitive. Yeah, they're definitely looking because they got all the code. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, it always bothers me when I do some kind of Kaggle on this home price prediction competition. Is I feel like I have to look at every feature and do you know EDA, and then I also need to look the relation between feature A with feature B. So it looks like you know it is it is two to the I don't know n you know steps that you need to go through for EDA. Um, it seems quite impossible to do. So I'd just like to ask, do you think this, this is a required step, or, or do you have maybe other thoughts on, on the piece? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I, I did that. I did look at all the feature interactions. There's a great package, I think it's called Feature IMP, Feature M, um, that uses XGBoost and actually deconstructs the trees looking for branches that are um, happen often. Uh, so I looked at that, but I, I Trying to be diverse, always try to make my neural network do the minimal. I do the minimal feature engineering prior to the neural network, so that the neural network will do the feature engineering for me. Uh, so Chahu, who did only a neural network, did hardly any EDA or feature engineering. Like he just made a neural network architecture that just brilliantly pulled all of the interactions out. Um, and uh, but yeah, I think it is an important step, especially in like a home price one where the where the columns do matter. Uh, it's definitely, the EDA came in, in handy for us, for sure. Um, yeah, so it sounded like you were tuning to the leaderboard ranking, and that's typically like a bad practice for Kyle, uh, because they, you know, they have a private, uh, separate data set where they then use to really rank you. Can yeah. You talk to that? Sure. Uh, let's see, so that is like this one. So what we found was we moved that holdout around that three month block and as we moved it, it was consistent. So uh, if we pushed it back three months, the score changes that we made to our models improved the previous three months. And we pushed it forward a month and forward and forward. 
and it was consistent all the way through, and then still consistent with the leaderboard. So a, a, a common thing that will get you on Kaggle is when the leaderboard that is in the public phase is very different from the private phase, and people say, trust your cross-validation locally, because the leaderboard could be a, like a trap. Um, in this case, in this competition, it wasn't a trap. Everything was very consistent all the way through. Uh, I'd like to know um, how you hooked up with your two partners, with the, with the other two team members. Uh, would, did they contact you? Did you contact them? What, what was that social interaction uh, like, or fellow researchers like? What, what brought the three of you together? It's weird. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, you, you really can't talk too much. You, know, you can't share. So definitely, it was it was awkward. I, I would say, but like uh, they reached out on LinkedIn, um, and then we just had a couple of exchanges. And I was like, I have this one more one more thing I want to try by myself, and then let's do it. And uh, it didn't work. The thing that I wanted to try by myself. So it was like, yes, let's definitely team up. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah, did you create any action features uh, apart from the given base data set and the external data set, like the ratios or any data fix? And how important that in your experience? Uh, so, uh, so I missed the first part of the question. I'm sorry. What kind of features? Uh, you you had a set of columns given in the base data set, mm -hmm. and also you got the external data. Did you create any additional fields based on your domain or other experience that makes your model more accurate? Definitely. And in your experience, how important they are? So I, you know, I, um, the, the, some of the things I guess that we did we can't talk about, um, but th there was a lot of um, diving into uh, location, I'll say this, location mattered way more than I expected. So everybody says like the th three <coughs> most important things about real estate are location. It's more like the 10, like everything we did with real estate. So everything we did with location mattered. So, so like subdividing neighborhoods and school districts and, and looking for overlapping pieces. So it's like important to be in this particular neighborhood in this school district, right? But not in this other school district, even though it's the same neighborhood. Like that kind of thing mattered a lot. So lots and lots of hyper subdividing. Uh, in general, I think my techniques there are uh, aggregation of the target up. So that, that kind of like mean encoding, those categorical encodings. That's kind of my general approach, is like trying to get as much information out of the numeric columns and push them into the categorical columns. You, how much did you uh, maintain the previous histories that you ran? You said you ran tons of experiments. Did you find yourselves going back to old experiments, and how did you manage that to even know what to go back to? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so I, I used um, uh, Jupyter notebooks throughout the competition, and every single experiment had a had a like a naming convention and the date and everything, and I went back all the time. Yeah, but like anything that seemed to work at all, I turned into a, a block, a code block, like a function like that, and then included in the pipeline. And even if I was only ever still using the first option, I still had all the other options in there. So I could go and say, I haven't tried that in a while. I'm just going to turn that one back on. So 30 years in location intelligence over here, but I do a lot of real estate investing. Do you look at all about who was selling the house, education level, a realtor selling the house, amount of experience, that type of thing? Yeah, I pulled in a bunch of stuff from the sales data they gave us, actually. Uh, but it was only available for sales, not for um, all the other houses. And we had to predict all houses, not just the ones that were sold. But I aggregated that up into the neighborhood level, looking for information about the sellers. So are there a lot of foreclosures? Are there a lot of um, trust uh, uh, purchases and those kinds of things? Uh, all of that definitely helped. Looking deep into the actual sale itself definitely helped. So <clears throat> the approach you took seems to be very tailored and a lot of work. And can you comment a little bit on if your job would take this and scale it nationwide for Netflix, what you would do differently, or how you'd scale this out to do all 50 states? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think it's scalable. I think we, you know, it, the, it had to run in commodity hardware in uh, seven days. And ours was maybe four days uh, start to finish. And that's including like the deep neural network training, which was pretty long. Um, I think, you know, the, the, 
uh, Python libraries, like if you could run it on Spark, you could do all of our feature engineering in 15 minutes or something probably. Uh, it's a really the slowest was the training and we were stuck with one GPU in terms of the like commodity hardware. So I would just say they should scale out to 50 GPUs and they could do one state at a per GPU or something. So could you scale out all the all the introspection of the model models and all the thinking about how to tailor these things together? Gotcha. No. <laughs> Definitely, that was like, yeah, we looked at five states, I think, you know, uh, that was 10 weeks, I guess, so, yeah, about 400 hours each, so something like 10 weeks of three people for five states, so I think they would just have to just, you know, additively push that through to a year to do it for everything, yeah. So, uh, talking about uh, uh, Kaggle in the real world, and uh, it seems like your previous data science pantry items were focused in the same domain as the Zillow. I, I wonder if you can speak to um, whether or not you had expert knowledge in the real estate industry in terms of solving the Kaggle. And does that help in Kaggle? And does it help in the real world to be a expert in the domain, domain knowledge? Yeah, definitely. I think um, those I really lucked out with those two um, uh, volunteer things. Like I was actually assigned to Habitat for, for Humanity. I didn't pick it, um, and that was one month before the Zillow Prize started. So that like it was huge because that was specifically looking for areas that needed help with housing, which is very very related to finding areas that are expensive or not, right? Um, so yeah, that was you know very lucky uh, for me. But I think definitely domain knowledge matters in problems like this one. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that some of the early competitions in Kaggle were won by physicists and not the people in the domain. I think that, like, maybe that's true early on in Kaggle, but as long as you have the domain knowledge and you're ready uh, to uh, try something that's sort of outside of the domain, you know, like, if you, even, if you have that domain knowledge, you can sort of forget it, right? You, like, practice to learn to break the rules or whatever. I think definitely domain knowledge in just about every data science situation I've been in helps, for sure. So um, once you turned the thresholds for the outliers and the features, did you use that holdout set? Did you combine it back with the, the training data? And if so, did you use those thresholds on the holdout set before you combined it back? We did, yep. Yeah, so, so in, that, in this, you know, there's the holdout sets in red. We had to repeat this for the full data set when we did the final predictions. Uh, and then we just used the same hold, uh, holdout number. Yes, uh, another location-based question. I'm not sure about the, the Zillow database as it was as it was existing. Did regarding the location attributes, was there something like a commute time to the major employment center? And if so, was that was that uh, existing Zillow model a little bit naive and not taking into account the richness of the time variation of that? Some nuances that you might have been able to pull from external sources to enrich your your performance over that. Yeah, so in round one, I, I did a, a, an actual distance calculation to the uh, centers of um, in industrial areas. That made a huge difference in round one. We weren't allowed to use external data, and that was the only way I could get at commute, because they didn't give it to us. They also didn't give it to us in round two, and the best way that I could get commute was from the ACS data, which actually has surveyed commute times um, at the block group level, which is pretty small. And then they were a little bit erratic, so like it didn't make sense to me sometimes that one block that's literally like a block away from another block has a 30-minute difference in the commute time. So smoothed that a little bit, and it was a big impact in the model. Yeah. Hi. Over here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Did you have any financial investments in terms of like AWS time if you used it, and if you had any other investments? What was your total? Yeah, so I, I have a $6,000 computer that was like two uh, $1,200 GPUs, and that was like running for two years on this pro this project, and then the two in the middle. Um, so that was my my investment, and then Nima used AWS, and he sent us he showed us his bill, and it was like a little bit jaw dropping. I mean, he, it was like uh, one month. I think he had uh, over $2,000 on. Uh, and for one month of the feature engineering stuff that he was trying, doing all this blueprinting, trying every single you know option, he was just spinning up, spinning up the uh, servers just right and left. And he's a startup C CEO, so he was fine. But you know, we were 
You're definitely like, wow, man, you're spending some money here. <laughs> that was one of my questions, actually. But uh, the other question I had is total investment time, total hours. You mentioned 400, but I think that was only for one part of it. So yes. total hours and total time, was it two years, year and a half? Yeah, well, round two, I'd say four to 500 hours each for round two. But that was just that second round. So for me, I did another at least 200 hours in round one. Um, and then in between, the only reason that I did the two Cairo competitions in between was to like get in shape for round two. So that's another 200 hours. So yeah, I mean, all in 800 to 1,000 hours over two years, probably. Two years? Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks so much, Jordan, for this great speech here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so would you please share a little bit more detail on the um, time series components of this um, process? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, um, uh, I think the year, year over year changes were very important um, to, to noticing areas of growth, right? So uh, there, there are areas of rapid gentrification, there are areas where they're pretty static. So sort of clustering based on time was important. Um, there were some, some things that uh, that Nima did that now Zillow owns and probably wouldn't let me talk about. Uh, so he had a lot of cool, cool tricks, and uh, we definitely also uh, thought about our neural network architectures in the context of time series. So you're probably familiar with um, recurrent neural networks, and convolutional neural networks, and that kind of stuff. That was definitely part of our thinking from the beginning of how do we capture those time series relationships architecturally. Last question. Okay, yeah, we're going to take one last question, and then we're going to take a 10-minute break to reset the rooms. So we'll try to restart at 10 till 3. Here. Uh, you mentioned you work at Data Robot. Okay. So you said that a lot of what you showed maybe can and should be automated. You're trying a lot of different things and seeing how it's affecting the end result. So which aspects of what you did do you think can and should be automated, and what relied on your intuition or your own personal experience that couldn't be given to a computer? Let's see, sorry, I wanted to show the slide. Uh, all of it can be automated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> says, says, uh, says again, it works for Data Robot. Um, so uh, optimizing your experimental lab in the context of Data Robot is that there are all of these blueprints already there and you don't have to do any engineering. So, uh, you know, just starting with that bot, that repository of techniques that for any problem it comes up like 100, um, that optimizes. Treating every experiment as a hyperparameter that's built into the blueprint uh, setup, and then blending is, the, is the, the step at the end. So, I mean, I have seen this work in a day, but, you know, to be fair, I think that's the full automation on a clean data set, and it's not, fighting against a whole bunch of uh, humans who are also trying to squeeze every little bit out that maybe these blueprints wouldn't cover. Um, so you can absolutely automate the whole thing, but you probably aren't going to win uh, a Kaggle competition with a full automation pipeline. Very good. Thank you very much. Everybody.